kind of changed. That kind of changes everything at this point because I, I, I didn't realize I was going into this with popularity, so I probably didn't need the squirrel here. It's kind of overreaching. So uh, welcome to uh, Lambda Days 2015, second edition, like double the size. Amazing. Um, really am amazing program. So I'm really uh, honored to be able to open this up. So I want to introduce to you uh, a little bit of fun and a little bit of craziness. Are you guys ready for that? Is it too early? Too early for fun and craziness? You good? Good? OK, good. So I want you to say hello to Bouncy Squirrel. Say hi, Bouncy Squirrel. It's just, it's just a picture. You'd think, I mean, with webcams today, you think he's going to say hi back, but this is just a still image. So Bouncy Squirrel is a creation of my son's, Elliot. This is Elliot. He's 10. Say hi to Elliot. Hi. It's just a picture. <laughs> Can't say hi back. So Elliot, um, Elliot's into programming, um, I'm, I'm happy to say. And uh, he likes Minecraft, and he likes Python. And one morning, he, he called me down. I was actually preparing for this talk, completely different topic. And he, he called me down and said, Dad, check this thing out. Uh, I've been working with this programming language called Scratch, and I've got this program here. This is Scratch. Say hi to Scratch. No. It's just a programming language. It's, it's not going to. So he said, Dad, check this out. I've got this, this squirrel, and he, he bounces around the screen. And so sure enough, the squirrel bounced around the screen. And I said, that's great. You know, I'm going to get back to preparing for my, my talk at this conference. And he said, hang on a second. Hang on, hang on. And he did a little change. And then the squirrel started to change colors like a rainbow. It just started to oscillate back and forth. And he sat back and laughed and laughed. And I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty funny. And, and, and he said this. He said, I could watch this squirrel bounce around for hours. <laughs> and it was one of those like pure kid statements that's just pure joy, pure satisfaction. And I knew at that moment that we were sharing that the programmer moment. I remember when I was his age, and I was actually programming a similar thing with sprites on a Commodore 64. I don't know if I said I could watch this you know, little box bounce around for hours, but it was the same thinking. It was the same feeling. And it, was, it, was, it, it struck me as uh, uh, this father and son moment that, that, that were, was bringing us together. And, and, I, and I said, what the heck is this language scratch? So I took a look at this thing. What is this language that attracts a, a, a 10-year-old uh, without any kind of training or, or, or uh, um, you know, formal education in programming? And I was a little bit concerned because when I started to look at this thing, this is, this is a, a picture of Scratch. Uh, it's a visual programming environment. And this is a program called Fish Chomp, as you can see. It involves a fish that chomps, as you can imagine. And I started to get into this thing and look at the code. Uh, so this is, this is a, a picture of the code. And I was a little concerned, you know, what, what, what is my son learning? You know, who, who's teaching my son programming? You know, and how are they teaching? And you can kind of appreciate my sensitivity to this. So I took a look at this thing. And... So this is some code. So I take, you know, when I, when I learn a new programming language, I, I like to read source code. So let's take a look at this thing. So we see this flag. When, when, when flag clicked, you know, it says a sw switch to costume, uh, open mouth. Okay, I'm following that. So, and then forever if, uh, distance to mouse pointer, uh, you know, uh, point toward the mouse pointer and move three steps. Okay, so I can kind of navigate the, the big, I'm starting to read this and understand it. I get this other one. When I receive got me, play a sound, chomp. Okay, I'm tracking here. Then repeat twice, switch to costume, closed mouth, and then open mouth. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm poking around, I'm looking at the images, and here's a picture of the open mouth. This is hungry fish, and then this is closed mouth. And, and you can see if you go back and forth like that, what's he doing? That's fish chomp. I could watch this fish chomp for hours. This is great. Look at this guy. So coming back to this thing, I just spent time trying to figure out what this program did. And as a functional programmer, somebody's trained kind of in, in you know, making programs say meaningful things, I don't like to have to go through that exercise every time I look at the code. So what's my instinct at this point? I'm going to rewrite this thing in Erlang. <laughs> so this is the real code version of that. And look at it. It's basically the same thing. When I receive got me, chomp. Now, so I put the word chomp in there, right? So I'm... I'm attributing higher level meaning to this program. That's something that satisfies me. I'm like, okay, now I can understand what's going on. And you can just stop there. You can stop reading. You don't have to know what chomp is. But if you ever have a programming language with a function named chomp, you might want to look to see what chomp does. So we'll take a look here. Chomp says play sound. And it was, so you'd play the sound. And then you would repeat something twice. 
snap jaws. Right, so this exact same thing that we just looked at. You see snap jaws, you switch the costumes, right? Back and forth. Remember this one here. That's that, that's what that does. Right? So we look at this code and we say this does the exact same thing, but it, it, it expresses it in a higher level meaning. Right? I don't have to interpret this, it says it right there. And that's the beauty of functional languages. Then is it possible to lower the lights a little bit so that maybe you can see the slides? Yes, of course, sure. Just a suggestion? Mm. Yeah, that's All right. Okay. Good. Or now, now can you guys see me? It's okay. No problem. No problem. Good. Okay. You can hear me. All right. So this is this is real code, and then it dawned on me that this is a moment, right? This is a teachable. This is what they call a teachable moment, where my I can like introduce this idea of functional programming to my son, Elliot, who just loves this bouncy scrolls, bouncing around, but I can show him this example in a language that he can understand, right? This isn't Erlang, but the, but the terms snap jaws and chomp are tied into, you know, what he's experiencing on, in this program. Okay, so this is a test. Now, by test, I want you to imagine coming-of-age test, right? This is back in time when, you know, culturally you would send a kid into the jungle to stare down a tiger, right? It was... You know, this is, you're going to go in a child and come out a young adult, right? just like that. So I'm going to give Elliot a test that's going to push him into this jungle. It's not a real jungle. We live in the suburbs of Chicago, so it's not an actual jungle with actual tigers. Don't have actual tigers, but we have Erlang, right? So we're going to have the child piece of a functional programming language and see what happens. This is a time for him to, you know, maybe not become a, a, a man, but, you know, a, a, you know mature. So... A time for him to go from kind of hacking on scratch to now thinking about programming as kind of a, a, an elaboration of, of higher level meaning. Well, we'll see how it goes. All right, so the test looked like this. I'm going to introduce a mystery program to Elliot, and it's co called Fish Jump. He doesn't know Fish Jump. I, I, I installed this thing. It's a sample program in scratch, and he, didn't see, he hasn't seen this, so he doesn't know what this is. I'm going to provide him code samples from scratch and Erlang both. All right, so he's going to see the scratch, and he's going to see the airline, and I'm going to ask him some questions. So different questions about the behavior of the program, and then I'm going to observe it. <coughs> so we'll see, you know, it's not quite an A-B double-blind test. You know, it's not that scientific. This is just sending him into the jungle to see what happens. Okay. So here's the material, goldfish. We have scratch material. Uh, this is a piece of paper. I printed it, and I gave it to him. Right? So it's a little packet of information. So this is the scratch version on paper. This is the Erlang version on paper. Okay, this is more colorful and fun, but this has you know, human words and describes the meaning. And you, you, can, you probably can't see this here. You saw before. It's got the, you know, the, the, the behavior of, this, of the program is, is called out as, as functions in this functional compositional pattern that we're all used to seeing. Okay, so that's printout number two for him. Uh, this is the goldfish. This is the victim in the game fish chomp. This is the thing that gets chomped. We haven't seen the goldfish. This is the hungry fish. You've seen hungry fish, <coughs> scratch versions. You've got the sprites, and then you have the code, all right? And then the other one. Get the idea? Okay. Uh, here's some of the questions. When the green flag is clicked, what does the hungry fish do? What happens when the hungry fish eats the goldfish? What happens? What secret power does the goldfish have? So now we're like, we can't go into the, the imperative instructional code here. We have to do some inference. So I'm, going to, I'm kind of curious to see how he's going to handle this. Is he going to dig in to the earling? Is he going to stare down that tiger? Or is he going to, how's he going to handle this? So I, want, I was interested in that. And do either of the goldfish or the hungry fish ever stop? Not an obvious answer to this question. Okay? Make sense? So this is the, this is, this is the test. So here are his answers. This is the answer sheet. Again, it's all uh, printout. There's no actual running of the program. And you can see, I'm going to zoom in, he gave himself an A+. <laughs> That, that is the highest grade that you can give yourself when you take a test. Yeah. He's very happy with the results. Here are some uh, answers to the question. <clears throat> what happens uh, when, the green flag is, uh, when the green flag is clicked? What, what does the goldfish do? Well, he swims and show. Uh, okay, all right. The show part, I think you're kind of just reading off the scratch. I'm not going to give you full. Okay, that's, all right, here's, here's another one. What secret power does the goldfish have? He swims and he responds. Oh, all right. So the word respawn does not appear anywhere in the scratch code, but it does appear in the Erlang code. So he, he got that, and I knew he used Erlang. He had to. 
Uh, right, because this is actually a tr very tricky question. Superpowers, you have to sort of get up into the storyline of, of the program, and when you're looking at these imperative instructions, do this, you know, greater than 10, repeat two, it's very hard to get a story out of that. You have to kind of play the game. Okay, so that's pretty good. So here's the result. So, Elliot, I'm Dan here, which language did you prefer? I think I know the answer. I think I know what he's going to say here. Oh, no. Okay, scratch. Let, so, Elliot, let me, uh, let me rephrase this. Um, <laughs> I don't think you maybe understood the question. You meant Erling. Erling is better, right? <laughs> eh? uh, okay, okay. Uh, Erling is complicated. Um, that is actually the wrong answer. <laughs> Not the one I was looking for. Um, it, 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 Elliot, if anyone ever tells you there's no such thing as a wrong answer... They're lying to you. Right? That was the wrong answer. So, why don't we talk about scratch? So, you know, we'll just shift. You know, we we know that you, that you find our language a little complicated. So, tell me, why is scratch so hard to understand? Okay. Okay. Elliot, I sent you into the jungle to stare down a tiger, and you have brought me a bunny. I need something. Uh, uh, I need something here. I'm going to bring out the big guns. So this is, this is the question that sort of lays the victim bare. Doesn't it bother you that Scratch is basically a side effect machine? <laughs> right? You know, what is he going to say to that? Snap. Yeah, that just happened. Huh? <laughs> and just, and just, to like, just to twist the knife a little bit more, he wanted me to know that the squirrel changed color. So, <laughs> so this is the result of that test. <clears throat> so I know you're saying, you're, you're thinking, Gary, you're being a little overwrought here. I mean, he's 10. Just kind of relax. He will in time learn that Erlang is the language of choice for anybody who wants to write software. He'll get that. We know that. But here's what gets to me, right? Last year, I did a survey on, the, I conducted a survey uh, and asked the Erlang community, so these are Erlang programmers, uh, what, uh, are, what, is, what are some of the challenges to adopting or using Erlang? And this is one of the results. This is a tag cloud, and the size of the text is reflected of, of the number of times a particular term was used. And you, you might see the term here that kind of jumps out. It's, it's hidden a little bit in the middle there. There's a general sentiment within the Erlang community, these are people who use Erlang as a language, uh, and love Erlang, are, are passionate about Erlang, that it's hard to use. And there's a number of reasons why. It's not because it's being pitted against scratch, right, in fairness, but there is a general sentiment that Erlang is hard to use. Okay, so that's kind of weighing on me in this particular, so I'm bringing some emotional baggage into this conversation with Elliot. I, I grant you that. Here's another view. Functional neighborhood, uh, this is a plot of pop basically popularity with the more popular languages going up to the upper right. <laughs> Erlang and some other functional languages are, are uh, sort of in a, se a second tier. It's highlighted in yellow. We can zoom in on that. We can see that they're ranked in a similar, uh, Erlang is ranked in a similar, <laughs> similar place to Scala, Clojure. Um, Lisp, Emacs Lisp is down there. These are not all functional languages, but you'll notice that in the, the top tier, uh, the ones in the far right, you know, Java, JavaScript, you know, C, C++, Python, there isn't anything that can remotely be considered functional. If you ever see somebody calling JavaScript a functional language, you hear this all the time, I just want you to reach out and just slap them. Just <laughs> say, that's from Gary. Slap them. <laughs> Don't slap them. And do not tell them. If you do, do not tell them. It's from me. <laughs> so this is weighing on me. Uh, so I've got this, you know, this, this sort of idea that, you know, while I believe in this stuff, I, you know, my instinct is to go take the Scratch program and go you know, whip up the Erlang version or the functional version, the one that I can read and understand. This is good. It's, you know, we all sort of come on the same page there. The rest of the world doesn't seem to get that. And it's not dissimilar to the conversation that I had with my son. It's not that different. So... You know, we can look at the market share here uh, and see exactly how small a share. This is, again, that neighborhood. This isn't even the functional part. This is just the not popular kids. 
it's a very, 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 very small percentage of mind share out in the marketplace. So, yeah, that's how I feel, right? So I don't want to leave it at that, though. This is, a, this is not you know, a language debate that I'm having with my son. For crying out loud, of course not. This is a father-son moment that's supposed to be beautiful. It's, we're supposed to share a common bond of program. I am not going to let this, these language wars get in the way of, of this moment with my son. So I want to go from sad dog to happy dog, optimistic dog. But I need a reason. I need something in my brain to help me think how are these things the same? What is important in this exchange that I had with my son? You know, do I want to get into a debate between you know, sort of impairment, imperative and exploratory practices and perhaps more deliberate meaning-oriented? Is that really is it a matter of just a kid playing around with something that looks like a Lego and, and, and a so-called adult who's, who's you know, using, using programming you know, for, for decades now? Uh, and just the difference in, in age and maturity. Is it something like that? How do I parse this? How do I, how do I put this, this moment into, into a happy place? All right. So this is the question. What's the thread that can tie Elliot's experience and my experience? That's kind of a big question because it's, it's not just Elliot's experience and my experience. It's all of our experience. What's the, what's the thread that can tie these things together? I have two words. I, I, I bet some of you are thinking I'm going to say lambda calculus. Right. Here's a surprise. Human emotion. So I thought a lot about this. And I really did. I, I really did struggle. You guys think I'm a little nuts here. And I'm, I'm kind of going through this. But I want a story for myself that I can, I can, I can resolve Elliot's practices and my practices, the thinking here of, 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 of different modes of, of programming, different modes of learning, and now I know you're, you're hearing this, looking at human emotion, thinking, I've come to a functional program conference, and Garrett is going to introduce this topic of human emotion. I didn't want to talk about that today. I'm a functional programmer because I don't like talking about human emotion. Give me a chance here to explain what I mean. There is some science here, and my first example to show you what I'm talking about, I will introduce the most emotionally charged hot topic icon in all of computer science, that Erlang function. This, for me, was an emotional experience. I didn't weep, I didn't break it down, but I did like it. And I want to explain what I'm talking about here, be very specific. When I first learned Erlang and saw Erlang, um, I was a bit mystified as to where the state was, because there are no global variables. You know, there's no place to put a, you know, go put a value somewhere. It was kind of a mystery. The, the answer is that the state is, is associated with processes, but that's, that's, that's not the story here. The point for me is, in an Erlang function, because there are no global variables, there's no context, even read-only context, that I need to worry about outside of the scope of a function. And this was the first time I had ever really seen that. And it's obviously it's very common in a functional paradigm. But this was my first experience with that. And for me, it was a sense of visceral relief, a pleasure to see this function and say, I don't have to worry about the context up here. There's no state or instance variable. You know, there's no class variable that I need to worry about. There's no locking contention. It's just this thing. And I can reason about this. The argument's passed in. There's some sort of a, a manipulation of that. And there's a return value. And so this thing for me, I looked at it and I liked it. And, and I, now what I want to do, so I've identified some sort of human emotion there. I like this thing. What's the next step? What I want to do here as an exercise is take that I like it expression and sort of identify why and use a pattern, language, identify what it is about this like that is universal or reusable. So I'm going to identify this thing as variables that don't vary. Now you might be used to seeing this as immutability. Immutability, unfortunately, is viewed by many as a misfeature in functional languages because Mutability is this thing that we do in programs. We change variables, some programs, imperative programs. We change variables all the time. And the ability to not do that feels like a restriction. So it's a bad thing. And you'll see languages actually try to work around that and give you the impression that you're, make, you're, you're mutating variables, even though it's kind of a bad idea in that language. 
or under the covers. So I want to identify a pattern here that has a bit more of a positive spin and identify why it is that this is a good thing. So here's my example. You can disagree with this, but understand it's a process of taking an emotion that I have, I like this, and trying to describe what is really good about this in Universal. So that's the process I'm going to go through right now. So check this out. All right. Values establish the rule of the game. Okay. So you're playing a game, you have rules. So when you're playing a game, nobody likes when rules change during the game. You're running a race, you won the race, and somebody says, I'm sorry, you actually didn't win because we changed the rules during the race. That's a bit frustrating. So here's sort of the universal truth, the, universal, the, the, the pattern here. Variables that don't change create a sense of security. Right. You're looking at this saying, duh. You know, this is why we like functional languages. Right. What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm driving a reasoned process about immutability or variables that don't vary and putting it, in a, putting it in terms that any human being can understand and appreciate. I think that this is a, a universal pattern in all humans. We don't like it when we, we think we understand something and then the rules have changed. So in a programming language, we can look at this as a pattern to say, when you, know, you see a variable, right? And, and, and you, you, the question is, you know, can this change or not? Is there some way to reduce the scope of impact of change on a system? And functional language happened to be very good at that. That's an example of a pattern. So what I'm doing here is I want to do something with these fundamental truths and systematize them in a way that we can share and elaborate and, and exchange information. When you see patterns, you're probably thinking about this, and you probably have an emotion. It's probably not a positive emotion. <laughs> when I see this, I have an emotion, and it's anger. It's disgust. I really am angry about this. Not personal. I don't know who wrote, I, know, I don't know anyone who wrote this, but I took this book when I was young, and I said, I'm going to implement every single, I'm going to use every single pattern in this book. And I did. I did. I literally, I, I was, you know, working a project, and we, we used pretty much every single pattern in this book. I have never seen such a monstrosity of an application as a result of that. So I have a personal kind of vendetta against this thing. So the term patterns here, have, in, my, in my, what I'm sort of presenting to you, so I'm introducing this kind of human emotionally informed pattern discovery process it has absolutely nothing to do with this other than the sharing of the word pattern. Right, so just let me be clear about that. I'm not talking about that, and I'm certainly not talking about if we want to d dive into the, some of this stuff. Example, builder pattern. Separate the construction of a complex object from its representation, allowing the same construction process to create various representations. If somebody ever says that to you, I want you to just reach out and <laughs> slap them. And you tell them that was from Garrett. <laughs> do that. Um, don't, don't, no, don't do anything violent, seriously. For the record, don't slap them. Slap them. <laughs> I'm not talking about this stuff. I'm talking about this stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that feels good. When we program and we sit back and we kick back and we enjoy something, I want that to inform our thinking about the good stuff in programming. I'm actually talking about this. And this is a book that, and, a, and, a, and an author that is cited as being the inspiration, right, the, sort of the thought leader for the, the, the software and architectural patterns uh, in software. Again, <laughs> the thing that these share, that this is The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander, uh, the thing that is common between Alexander's vision of a pattern and what we see in software today is the word pattern. And that's it. It's as if they read this book and got to the word pattern language and then said, I got it, and then just closed it. Right? It, it is completely the opposite point of view. And what I want to do here, uh, and give you some examples, and, and try to maybe consider reviving this, I, these ideas, I want to talk about what this guy's talking about. And, and, and that, for me, is sort of the reconciliation in this Elliot Dad discuss, this discussion. Here's a quote from Alexander. Patterns are made from thought without feeling lack, lack, empirical react, lack empirical reality entirely. And he says this type of thing throughout his book. And the reason he says this is that there's sort of an instinct in humans, and sort of particularly intellectuals, that feeling is somehow not a legitimate point of view. And so 
he will liken the work that he's talking about uh, to, you know, to being as rigorous and difficult as theoretical physics. So he's being a little defensive here. And I understand that. It's the same problem I had when I said human emotion. I was just like, what is this guy talking about? How could this possibly have anything to do with software? It's an interesting phenomenon. But the, his point here is that the emotional experience that we have as programmers is really basically what we have as human beings. Languages and, and, and what we do as programmers is all very, very human. Right? We're not writing this stuff for the computer. We're writing this stuff for ourselves. So this, he's talking, Alexander talks here about building, so it's physical architecture. But the same types of principles can apply to software. So he says that patterns made from thought without feeling lack empirical reality entirely. All right, so keep, keep this in mind that feelings are a central part of his, of his, uh, of his model. Patterns n- do not come only from the work of architects and planners. And so he's saying, look, this is not something that the ivory tower uh, has exclusive domain over. And that, I think, is what we've been given as software programmers. An ivory tower point of view pattern, very intellectual. He goes on to say they come from the work of thousands of different people. So my wish would be that we take back patterns. So I want to give you some examples. I know this is a little bit fuzzy right now, but I want to give you some examples and go through some concrete sort of exercises to see how emotion can inform actual elaboration of real effective patterns that we can use when talking to people about languages, designing languages, designing libraries, designing products. We can use this throughout our work as programmers. Okay, so let's look at some more examples. I know you're going to think that this is soft. I know you're going to think this is kind of fluffy thinking here. I'm going to work to try to show you that this is actually a rigorous process. This is a difficult process. When I used Scratch, I liked a particular thing about it. I found myself liking it. And that's just emotion. I'm not thinking. I just found myself going to the same point in this, this graphical display. And it was the event handlers. And now, it's, as a process here, I want to translate that raw emotion. I like this. This feels good to me. Is why does it feel good to me? Why does this make sense? Why, is this, why do I keep you know, feeling good about this thing? So, so try this. Try this on for size. So this is the example here, uh, when, you know, an example. When Spacebar is pressed, so you'll see this all up. Basically, all the code blocks in Scratch are, in, are, are, are triggered by external events. So it is an event-handling, event-oriented design, first and foremost. Um, so this is, this is Scratch. So what is the elaboration of this pattern? How do we describe this? Very simply, events happen in time and space. Code is called when an event occurs. It creates a sense of connection to the world outside your program. And you're thinking, okay, this is, this is kind of dumb, right? Duh, like event-driven. Like, why are you going through so much effort to try to map this into this soft, sort of non-scientific language? We, as a community of functional programmers, have had a hard time getting our message across to folk, right? You saw the graphs. You saw the mind share. You saw the, the, the popularity contest and where things fall out. Right? I think we have the math right, quite literally. I think we have perhaps the message wrong. I think that we may be thinking about design features in our languages with a little bit too, a little bit too much deference to the lambda calculus. So I'm deliberately softening this. I'm deliberately trying to get down to the story that is compelling to people. Will that influence our thinking in the way we design things? I think it absolutely can. So I do understand this is not a scientific you know, breakdown. I'm not trying to be mathematical here. I'm trying to be human. <coughs> and I'm trying to communicate. But very specific features come out when we do this. I'm discovering. OK, here's another example. Functional composition. Uh, why is this is, this is, this is, uh, this is my, this is my thing. I like functional composition. So anytime I see something I don't understand, uh, or it takes me more than a moment to grok, I will go map that to a function. And, and I have, you know, if you see, the code that I write tends to be you know, one or two lines all over the place, and I think very, very hard about how to name things. So I like this pattern. All right, so what's going on here? So this is an example of, uh, of an Erlang function. You've seen this before. This is nothing new. But this is now describing some sort of you know, pattern behavior using functions and its composition. It's not the best example of strict composition. Again, I'm just trying to get a story across here. I'm not presenting you lambda calculus. I'm not building a, a you know, type theory here. I'm just showing you, you know, kind of a storyline. So what's the, what's the pattern 
how would I elaborate this pattern? Functions name behavior of things. Be I'm sorry, functions name behavior and things. Right? They do. So functions can be composed to tell stories using human words. This creates an affirming confidence in how a program works. This is what's going on with Bouncy Squirrel, right? You know, or, or other emotional dynamics in programming. It's why people say this is fun. Have you ever seen people using Ruby and Rails and JavaScript and they love it? I'm, I'm just going, what? How, how is it possible that you love this? I, this is horrible. Like, that's, that's arrogant and ridiculous. I should stop and un try to understand what is, what is tr motivating them. And it's an emotional thing. It's not an intellectual thing. It might, there's, there's, there's aesthetic values. There's all sorts of other things. <clears throat> but there are practices and, and patterns in that, in that emotion that we can use and we can learn from. We can put them into our languages. And there are, uh, I, I think Elixir is a, a good example of, I, I think, a, a, an emotionally driven, you know, motivated, and, and I'm not, I don't say that in a derogatory term. I think it is humanly motivated. It is, tr it is tried to put the power of, of some of these functional models into the hands of folk. And I think in order to do that, we have to, got to drive past the mathematics. We've got to find a way to, to, to reconcile the scratch Erlang test. Right? We, think it's a, we think it's a paradigm conflict. You know, it's this or that. It's really something that cuts through orthogonally. So I'm proposing that we pick up Alexander's notion of patterns and, 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 and use that, take back this unfortunate, this unfortunate advent where patterns have been hijacked, essentially, by the architects. The exact opposite of what Alexander talks about. All right. Here's some quickly some other patterns. I want to you know, have some time for some discussion here. Um, REPL. Okay, so everyone likes a REPL, but there are languages that don't have a REPL. Every language today needs to have something that lowers the stakes of getting something right. And I think we can experience that you know, when, we, when, we're, when we're picking up a language and we like something, we say, this is, this is great. What's going on with a REPL? You're experimenting, you're playing. You're learning. It's that sort of Elliot experience with, uh, with Bouncy Squirrel. So REPL, this rep, to me, represents a pattern that we should look for in our program, something that lowers the stake of getting something right and encourages play and experimentation. A visual model. Uh, I don't really like visual programming, but the fact of the matter is that, 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 that visual models reinforce our understanding of a program. We don't have to use necessarily the visual tool to write the software. Right? We certainly can, but... There t tends to be a lot of pushback uh, on, or I don't know if it's pushback, but to say, well, wait a second, you know, you've got the visual tool and that's all nice, that's all fine and good, but my text is just as much a model as that. I've heard this argument quite a bit. That's, that's also true. But let's just be affirming, affirming of the, the human sort of visual in inclination. And let's start to think about adding more visual tools to functional languages. I would love to have... The, a, a better ability to visualize things. I use Emacs. It's a challenge to, to use Emacs to really visualize things. I would love to have some breakthrough in tooling on that front because I really enjoy what Scratch brings to the table on that front. On the converse, human-readable text, another pattern. It lets our code participate in a broader social context of text-based tools and services. All right, so we see that Scratch, one of Scratch's limitations is that you can't really get to text. You can't really go put stuff in GitHub. You can't you know, diff it. You can't apply sed to it or grep. So this is kind of a de de deficiency, I think. So this is another pattern. It's very specific, right? And why is it, why is it good? Why do we like text-based programming? Well, it just opens up a world of tools and social, social patterns that are, would otherwise be very expensive to, to recreate or, if not, impossible. So this is specifically you know, different patterns that elaborate value, but they're informed by emotion. So my point here, and this is what I'd like to get across, is emotions are signals. They point to something real. Don't shy away from them. So when I say the common thread, the thing that ties Elliot's experience and my experience together is we both love this stuff, and we're being informed by specific things. Elliot, I observed, was uh, attracted to the fact that you could iterate through changes very, very quickly, very much like Legos. You pick something up, you put it together, you get immediate feedback. How many of our languages have that level of feedback? I encourage you to go grab, grab Scratch. 
get, it's, it's a small talk derivative, so it's, you're building sort of in, in, the, in the runtime environment. So the, the difference between build time, code time, and runtime is blurred in, in, a, in a small talk environment. So you'd expect that. But that's a great experience for, for any programmer. It doesn't have to be a kid, any of us, playing around with things. That emotion drives that. My emotion to, to, to elaborate and bring meaning to things, again, pointing to something real. So I want this true and useful pattern language. I want it for people. We experience it. It's not something that is uh, handed to us in a book. It's not something that somebody goes and ponders like this for a while and mapping things out. I think that's all fine and good. But if it doesn't make an, 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 if it doesn't tie into something that we can experience viscerally, like I like this, this feels right to me, I think we throw it out the window. So emotion, was this emotion-driven development? I don't know, it's pattern language. Patterns are not prescribed, they're discovered. There's, some, there's, something, there's something about this process that comes from the human makeup. So we are a product of, of, of this evolutionary you know, chain, and computers are very, very new, and we're, we're using languages as intermediaries between our brains and our, our, soci our society and the machines. This is entirely a human practice, and we'd be foolish to ignore our human responses to certain things. So these cues are things that will inform our thinking and point us into directions. What is good about this? And I want to elaborate that. I'm going to put a name on the pattern. I want to describe it in a way that I can share it. That's a pattern language. Experience and experiential and not theoretical. This is somewhat of a, a restatement of the second point. We're not sitting back and theorizing about this. We are experiencing it quite literally. And finally, and this is for me why this was important, it cuts across these language categories and tribal affiliations. And I think intellectually we know that. We know, you know we're all brothers and sisters in, 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 the, in the common effort to write programs. We know that, right? But sometimes we get a little tribal and we get a little judgmental and, you know, understandable. This is a specific model that is constructive, right? What comes out of this is real. Like, you can make good quality design decisions out of this process. So it's not just, hey, let's all get along and feel good. It's let's build better software, better languages, better tooling, better libraries. And it is this thing that, for me, reconciles it. So I can look at Elliot and reason about his experience. I can look at me and reason about my experience and have absolutely no problem with any of it, right? Because it's just a human endeavor. And, and these, these specific things come out of that. So... The lesson is, go forth and feel. I want you just to be, every, like, if you see something that you like, stand up and, and just say, yes, that's, I'm no, just kidding, don't do that. <laughs> you can if you want. I mean, that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Does that, is that completely crazy? No. All right, I got one fan, that's good. <laughs> that's all I want. All right, so I want to open this up for, we have, um, we've got a good little time for discussion here. Um, so let's, uh, let's, uh, I want you guys to, to yell, get angry, get emotional. Yeah. yeah. I think I know why your, your kid likes Scratch, because kids tend to think that all the people are boring and that they want to push the boundaries and actually even be confronted with mistakes. Think about young people driving 200 kilometers an hour and well, maybe accidents can happen. Yeah. And we actually don't like, if you are old, you don't like, so it's just pushing the boundaries and actually by doing things imperatively. Also, actually, they, they, their parents always tell them what to do, and in fact, they can now tell that to the computer, also interesting, just saying, like, do this, do that. And I think that's maybe okay. that's, uh, a difference. So we can take a pattern under that, a sort of the rebel pattern, or, or don't tell me what to do, right? I mean, that, that's, you know... Who wants to be? That's, so, that's, so, so I'm sort of talking about things that feel good, but we can also talk about th things that feel bad, right? We you know I really don't like what being. T I mean, when I you know go learn something, so lo lowering barriers to entry. This process is actually quite hard. I don't know if I could simply when I when I was trying to put language behind this. This actually took quite a bit of effort, and I know that the language that comes out of this is soft. I understand that. I've, I've made this point, but it, it, I find it very difficult to. You know, we talk, you talked about you know, risk-taking and, and not being, wanting to be controlled. How does that specifically translate into a language feature? Now, I think you can do that. It's difficult, though, and it takes a certain discipline. And, and this is what Alexander talks about as being difficult. 
Feeling is not difficult, right? We can feel things instinctively. That's not what we're, what we're saying here. But it's translating that feeling into something, a pattern, that you can absolutely, tangibly apply when you build software. So I don't know where that goes, but that, that, that is certainly a, 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 something that should land in the next patterns book here, the, the emotionally driven patterns book. What's that? Fail fast. Okay. And uh, the problem with Scala was that you know you can either get functional or you can get imperative. If you want to stay functional, you have to really, really try to stay functional. In Erlang, you have no choice. It's just elegant. I think that's the key. <laughs> I think that was summarized perfectly. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, for just to be, you know, to, 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 to sort of take this to a personal level, I don't know. This is brand new. I, I, you know, I'd like to understand why, Scott, if, if there are people who like all of the options in Scala and say this is, this is great, I'd, like to, I'd really like to, to get in sort of and dwell that. So maybe it's a, a sense of being able to migrate and, 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 and not forcing a, a complete shift on somebody to say, you know, if you're used to this model... You can take steps. I had some conversations last night with some folks who said, you know, we only use purely functional Scala. I'm like, I didn't even know there was such. I mean, that's, that's cool. Uh, is there like a mode that you can put the compiler in to say, you know, yes, I just want, that would be really nice. And so you have, or you have, you know, sort of a, a warning flag or something to say. And then you could, you could have a migration story. So this, to me, I, I, I will be completely honest with you. I'd say two weeks ago, I would have I've had very sort of grossly negative things to say about any given language. I, I really, I think I might have just been converted here. Like, I, I might actually have an open mind to things. It, it's, it's not to say I have an open mind to bad patterns and dangerous things, but what do people like about this? I really am very interested. You see these patterns in, in JavaScript where you've got this, these chaining functions where it's like function dot and then dot. You see the, the patterns that people use, like, it's like, a chain of dot invocations, and what's happening is the object gets passed along, so you're simultaneously side effecting and then returning the object that was modified. I look at that, and my mind is blown that people could possibly do this. Why are you, why are you doing this? Why, they seem to like it. It's, I, I honestly would like to understand that. I truly do. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So, so there's something in there that's fun and is likable. It scares me. I look at that and I just, I'd just i say, don't do that. But the fact of the matter is, people do it and they like it. So I want to understand that. So, you know, what does that translate into something that might be useful for a functional language? I bet there's something there. I bet there's a, a human, you know, base instinct to do something there. I would only speculate, but that's a discipline. So, why not? What's wrong with that? Yeah. So what's a pure functional job? Why not purely functional Java? <laughs> if anyone ever says, why not fun purely functional Java? Just, just. <laughs> no, don't do that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, maybe that's Scala. Maybe, maybe that's what, you know, Scala offers that. I think, you know, if there is one, it would be Scala. Um, if, you know, you want to, to help uh, somebody within the Java uh, community take steps toward a more functional it's called value proposition, right? Let's, you know, I mean, come on. Look, look at some functional languages. There, there are violations all over the place. I mean, what is functional? I mean, it, it, it's a preponderance of, of, of the use of, of, of the functions, right? There's generally immutability involved, but sometimes there isn't. You know, and, and you have various ways of handling this problem of side effects, you know, degrees of purity. I mean, really, come on. It, you know, I understand... I understand the arguments, and believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm with you all. I, I, I'm, I, I, it's hard for me to go back. I try to write in functional patterns using imperative languages that, that basically are side effect machines, and it's kind of impossible. You really don't get the same benefits, so I understand it. But I, I'm, we've been stuck 
for a long time. It's not like functional programming is that new. It's fairly new, but it's not that new. And I think we've got to figure out something to get more traction. And it isn't because we want our, our, the population to swell. Who cares, right? Be happy with a small community. It's to, get, it's to improve our civilization, right? We've got good ideas here. So let's help programmers be better. We work with them, right? Do you like working you know, as a functional programmer? Do you like working with a, folks who don't care about functional programming and don't like you because you're a functional programmer? Does that feel good? It feels bad. So you know, adoption, I think, is becoming, for me, kind of a personal passion. And this is a practical bouncy squirrel. Look at him. He's so cute. Bouncy squirrel is, is, gives us a, I think, this, and it's really, it's really Alexander. It's, it's a really very, very good model that he proposes. And it, it's very applicable to, to software. I like this a lot. I really like the fact that it gets to the way we are built the way we operate, and it's a, it's a discipline in understanding what works well for humans. And so there's no reason to say mathematics, I win. Right? That's usually the debate, or that's how we win the arguments, to say lambda calculus, I win. I got a question for you. Um, because you propose a theory that it seems elegant, so I like it, so it sounds like something that could be legit. But if we, gotta, if we have to sort of uh, judge it on its merits, let's push it to the boundaries. Go. And the question is, are you, do you think you're bold, you have a bold enough statement to say that um, the, at, at some primitive level, every programmer, like everyone in the community, shares the same, let's say, emotional uh, things? Yeah. Like, is it platonic in that sense? Is there like a uni are there universal, like, best versions of this? So if, if I'm going to go to Christopher and Alexander's point of view, um, he's going to build a home that, that he thinks is beautiful that many people will think are, is beautiful. But if you have a, a, you know, a, a fear of open spaces, you know, you're not going to like a room like this. This is a nice room. I like this space. If you, are, if you are built in a way where you don't like open spaces, your home is going to be very, feel claustrophobic. And that's just the way you're built. So there are absolutely variations. And you will never eliminate the variation in languages with this theory. You might get a lot more languages. Um, but for any given person, uh, uh, you know, there's a point of view and there's something you know, driving that. But there are preponderances with, within broader communities. So this is not an exact science at all, but it is a science. It's a discipline of trying to elaborate these principles. I think you have ranges of principles. I think people, you, know, you, you might have trolls that say, you know, I like it when the rules change from under me. Okay, uh, fine, maybe you do. I think most people don't. So... Um, you know, you don't have, this is, not a calcul, this is not a formal calculus applied to the human race. You're going to have variation. I think that's fine. But, you know, goodness gracious, you know, what, are we going to concede patterns to these ridiculous, I mean, come on, these, these, these architectural patterns, if you read them, they are truly bizarre. And, and, and people will use them to build truly bizarre systems. They have no grounding in human experience whatsoever. This... Yeah. So they might make that argument, but I'll make the argument that if you hear something that doesn't make sense, and if you ask 10 people, how does this strike you? And they're all scratching their head going, what? What are you going to do? Say, that guy's a smart guy in the room, therefore he's right. I'm not going to say that. If you can't manage to get your pattern in a way that those 10 people can, can understand and accept, reject it. it have you seen, you've seen these systems that are built, Right? Bridge patterns or, you know, these crazy adapter, these adapter layers. These are systems that, all right, I don't have the science to back this up, so I can't make it. But if you ever see this, it just... <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. Sorry, but even your comment about open spaces, mm -hmm. uh, your, your comment about open spaces, it sort of brings up this issue that of common sense versus science. Because open spaces could be just a trend, as in people think they want open spaces. Because you have like psychology experiments which show that even though <coughs> open spaces might be trendy right now, thousands of years of evolution have shown that people, have, through all these years that they've been looking for shelter, at a, at a psychological level, they actually feel more. They feel better in, in smaller spaces, even though the trend is to build big yeah. ones, right? Yeah. 
I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't know what the. I don't know what the pattern is. So Alexander and, um, and a team put together a, a huge set of patterns, and it's just an, an instantiation of patterns. You find them useful or not, you can throw them away if you don't like them. Um, but they are very intuitive, and you can read them, and they don't make you. You're, you they don't make you extremely confused, thinking that you're you're a dumb person because you you haven't thought about how to abstract the process of creating something that you can't even identify. I've seen very complex systems in big enterprises too, and 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 you know simple direct solutions to problems are better than uh, than than crazy abstractions that take teams six months to go build and don't serve any purpose. I think we can agree with that, and then we go measure it. Then we go into the field and see how these patterns actually work or not. I'm not saying I don't know. You'd have to go study it, but I think I'm right. Yeah. Um, hi. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think there's anything in the discussion, this discussion sounds a little bit like the, the religious war of Dynamic Static. Uh, and I wonder what your thoughts are on that. This discussion sounds like a, a religious war. Okay, well, if you... Know, there's there's, there's, there's a, some, some, uh, some elements of the discussion yeah. that sound like... I've heard them before yeah. in exactly the same manner for... Oh, you know, if you feel good, then it's good. And it's not... I, 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 ha, I, I have a... I, I feel... I know where you come from, where the feeling of the joy of coding is. Yeah. But also, I can see where uh, maybe patterns in, the, in that way, I know what they were built to. Yeah. So it's like more. No, I, I, so it's not to say we feel good, let's go crazy, la la la. Uh, it's to say, it's to say, so there's two things. There's, there's, there's two things going on in static dynamic, just as an example, right? In static, you invest time up front and you get information about the behavior of your program and the way your program is shaped early on in the process, but you have to invest time in that. In a dynamic language, you don't have to invest that time. You can get by without spending any time at all, and then you find out <laughs> your behavior of your, of your program down the road. So there's a trade-off there. What I would do is look to see, and both, both are fun. Both, you know, people who use types to, to, to sort of get things right, at least as far as the, the type system is concerned, will tell you that it's an enjoyable, fun process. Uh, people who use dynamic languages will tell you it's a fun big process to do that as well. So what is it about these specific threads of experience are, are, are good? You know, the so I don't know. I, I, this, is, this takes a lot of time and effort. I'm not going to throw that out. But it is not a matter of throwing your hands up and saying what feels good is great. That just, an inform, it just informs your, your thinking and points you in a particular direction. And then you systematically break down what's going on here, why do we like this, and then try to put that into a language that we can describe, we can use to share a, a pattern language that's a bit more <laughs> human. Go ahead. Do you feel like there's a good chance that, I just, I suspect that there's a good chance that our backgrounds kind of inform our emotional ties to how we program? And so if we have a background in deep mathematical theory, we may be drawn to, we may think that certain code is elegant, but if you don't, if you're a child of writing scratch, you probably don't have that same emotional tie to, say, type theory. Um, don't you think maybe this could be... He will, though. He will soon. He'll be exposed to that very soon. If he says, okay, like, I have like, a whole lot of food that came from the area I grew up in that a lot of you guys probably would hate. And I'm sure the reverse is probably true as well. So you think that there's any of that? Like, it's just from our background, there's no universal reason we all like the same type of coleslaw? Uh, yeah, there, there could be acquired taste, but there are also uh, great dishes that, that translate, uh, that cross all boundaries. The Chicago hot dog, for example. Everybody <laughs> likes that. Everybody likes that. Um, a, you know, a, a Hyderabad biryani. I mean, it's a universal... So, I mean, maybe... You know, we don't have to start with the things that are controversial. Maybe we can just start with the things that, or, or, or try to build some things that we have consensus on. Um, you know, if, you're, if your brain is wired a certain way, um, again, I, mean, I would just go back. So I wasn't saying that open spaces are necessarily good. I'm just saying that, I mean, I, I, I happen to like this, this, this room, but there may be others who don't. What's the science behind that? I, my point here is that you don't want to have to force one thing on everybody, so you allow that variation. But... I, I guess I would, I would say, where are, we are, where are we today with this discipline of being able to elaborate things that are deeply human and, and you know, qualitatively good and reusable and can create great software? Where are, we at, where are we at today? When I look at the pattern stuff, I may be overreacting a little bit. I don't think I am, though. I think that stuff is bad. I would say that's, that is horrifying what we've done on that front. 
and let's just try this and see what happens. You know, I'd start with that rather than trying to get this into a calculus. Yeah. You mentioned the visual model, and uh, we see in Scratch it's very colorful. It shows blocks quite nicely. Is there something particular you miss when using your current tool set? I assume you have colors in Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> I have colors. It's funny you say that. Um, I just went through like a retooling on Emacs. I went, I went to go use, uh, I was like, you know, this Emacs stuff, there's got to be something out there that's a little bit newer and nicer. And I spent a lot of time uh, on, on looking at um, alternatives. And I just came back to Emacs because I'm like, all the other alternatives have other problems, and, and Emacs is, is pretty, pretty darn good. And then I stripped away all these colors, and I came up with a really minimalistic color, color theme. But, yeah, I do have colors, and, and, and they are bright and gaudy just like that. I don't think it's a matter of colors in this case. I think it's a matter, I think the motivation for Elliot in, in, is not the colors, it's the immediate feedback. It's, so I would say, you know, if we were to sit down with him and say, what motivates you? I very much doubt it would be the colors. It would be the fact that I can get started on, on an animation with no effort at all and then iterate almost seamlessly at every step to see, so. But what, is there something that you can point at when you're talking about this visual model. Is oh. something like a direction to, to go to... Oh. This? oh, yeah. I'll give you a perfect example. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so, one of the, so I advocate, and I like lots of functions, really, really small functions. And you'll see the code. In fact, you saw the picture, the, 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 the printout of the code. Line, 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 line. And the, and the human reaction a lot of people have, and I have also, when you see that, you don't like it because you don't know, what's, it, 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 you don't know where to start looking. You don't know, you know, is this high level, is this... And so people will want to then start to put them into modules or group them and sort of organize them so they can get some sort of structure. There is, in fact, a very precise structure to this code, but you just can't see it. So what I would like is an editor or a visual model that will allow me to look at a particular level. And it, it, it's not really cold, code folding because you need to understand who's... It's, it's the call tree. So you have high-level functions that represent sort of high-level meaning and low functions that are lower. And I want to be able to say, okay, I want to look at this and see how it relates to the thing above it and below it. I can't, I, there are some things that can do that. But, you know, in Erlang, there are some tools that, but they're, they're, they're early stage. Uh, they're hard to work with. But I think that's an area that we could push on for sure, from visualizing a functional program as an example. Okay, so I've got time for one more question. Okay, so uh, you you shown us some a book with bizarre patterns, right? The question is, isn't the functional way of programming a bizarre thing itself? Because when normal people, normal programmers, right, uh, want to do something, let's say put their pants on, when you the, you did you just, 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 just say put your did you just say put your pants on? Yeah, <laughs> a very sure. normal thing for everyone, right? Yes, yes. So now think about the next steps, and that is very imperative, right? You don't compose how you're going to put your clothes on. Yes. Okay, this is fine. So um, I have I have thirty seconds to, to sort of hypothesize here. Um, I think both models work. You have um, the imperative model. Uh, and I use sort of imperative style when I, when, when I don't understand a problem. I don't have the right, the right model does not come out of my code initially. It is very incremental and it is very much like putting your pants on one, one pan at a time, sort of stepwise, do this and then, okay, I got this. Now, once I've done that, I want to tell the story that I know I just wrote, right? So I'll then refactor this and I'll, I'll put it in a, in a sort of this, this pure declarative functional, but that's a story at that point that anybody can read and understand. So I think in this case, it's both. Um, it's, it's, I th I've seen, I've, I, I think most people work this way. They don't understand the problem until they really see how the solution working. And so it's a very experimental and iterative process. And then once you see that, you have a model. And I think that's where functional language, and functional languages that, that put you into a compositional mode to begin with will let you tell, I think, a more pristine, clear story, much, much cleaner, with less context and weird things and less room for bugs. So, uh, we'll, you know, experimentation, play, story, understanding, meaning, all in the same thing. There's, a, there's probably four or five patterns in there. Again, this is hard. Like, to, to take this stuff and really understand what's motivating a human being and what's good here that we can reuse in features, I think, is work. So, I can't just go dive into this, and, but I, I would approach it. I would approach your comment.
that way. Okay, with that, thank you very much.